between the two levels of <laughs> economics and politics during this period, and I very much look forward to discussing with you and to hearing what you have to say. Um, basically, my uh, intention was to give a different interpretation of the political economy behind the crisis be beyond the standard one. So I will use an economic language, but the message will be mainly political. At the beginning, is uh, pretty consensus, uh, the, the consensual view of uh, how the crisis uh, set in, and basically we all know financial integration brought interest rates uh, down, especially in the so-called periphery. Uh, nominal rates converged toward the German uh, level. Uh, credit standards eased pretty much uh, throughout the euro area. And this amount of credit uh, strengthened the economic activity, increased the imports, pushed up wages. We all know this story and brought current accounts on a divergent path around the euro area. And uh, this is shown in a somehow apparently inequivocal way uh, from this, uh, in this figure in terms of divergence between core countries, current account of the balance of payment in core countries and in the periphery. Uh, on the basis of this economic uh, uh, matter of facts observation, uh, what came up was a number of more political interpretation. The root cause of this divergence was found in the divergent path of unit labor cost, and we see many of the countries of the periphery diverging in the first 10 years of the euro area. Well, we know uh, Germany was capable of keeping unit labor cost at a pretty stable, at least, level or below the rate of increase of productivity. Um, it is the only way. It is the only way to interpret how uh, political economy reacted to the first ten years of the euro. My idea is that we have moved uh, beyond this uh, static analysis of demand and the effects on the current accounts. Uh, what we have introduced is uh, uh, an attempt to interpret the crisis as a divergence in the political capacity of single countries. So which kind of indicator can we use to say how good a government is in reacting to a situation of uh, predicament? Uh, well, I try to, uh, to use this total factor productivity, which is a way you combine a certain endowment of capital and labor. So the way you reform the labor market or the accessibility of capital or the competition on the capital market in order to get an efficient combination of the two production factors. This is total factor productivity. And if you see the variation in the first 10 years of the euro, you see that the, those countries who had a lower vari a, a, a worsening of total factor productivity are exactly the countries that are suffering the most. So you find Portugal, Spain, Italy, Ireland, Greece, and so on. So apparently the crisis is not only a matter of unit labor cost, it's a problem of political capacity. But then there is a further step, which is even more, uh, more disquieting, more troubling in terms of... Uh, and this is a second step. Is it not only political capacity? Is it political inferiority? And obviously it's a troubling question. And how can you get this indication? Well, uh, you use a variation of total factor productivity uh, as an indicator of political capacity. And on the other axis, on the horizontal axis, I use an indicator which I call institutional quality, which is uh, an indicator which is produced by the World Bank, putting together uh, a in quality indicator about corruption, transparency, government's accountability, freedom of the press, and so on. I, I wouldn't buy at face value this kind of indicator at all. I've seen inside this indicator, and it's a mess the way it is constructed. I don't rely on it. But still, it's very common to hear it mentioned in uh, 
technical and political economic uh, analysis. And the two things actually work pretty well. It's not only a certain delay in political implementation that makes you slow down on the road to reforms. It's really a problem of a society which is not responsive enough. Uh, maybe the media are not good enough in saying uh, it's your time to react, so politics uh, must feel the pressure and so on. Or maybe the people are in denial, who knows? But the point is, there is something in this uh, troubling uh, picture of Europe as, a, as an area with different cultures and different quality in the societies. But as I tell you, as I told you, I'm, I'm not sure this is uh, solid enough to be uh, accepted as a, as a conclusion. And in fact, if you take a step back, you see that the old cons this old construction is a bit wobbly. Uh, this is, again, current account balance in the larger countries. And you see that the explanation about divergence in unit level cost and current account of uh, France and Italy, for instance, is not convincing. France and Italy until 2008 are not really diverging. So how is it possible? Uh, how can we put together the two things uh, that we see unit level cost, this is in Italy, these are two indicators, real effective exchange rates based uh, the green curve on unit level costs, the one which we have seen diverging so much from the German level, and the other based on the price levels. There are two standard indicators that the IMF publishes. And you see that there is this enormous divergence. So unit labor costs in Italy were way off the German level, but the price level remained the same. And this is consistent with the fact that the current account of the balance of payment was not really going down the drain. Well, what happened in between? There are many explanations about the compatibility of these two indicators. Uh, but unfortunately, there is a nasty one, which is uh, Italy. Uh, succeeded in keeping uh, its competitiveness at a decent level during the 10 years of the euro, unfortunately by increasing the unobserved economy. And between, this is a, a table produced by the Banca d'Italia, the Italian Central Bank, that shows that between 2005 and 2008, uh, an amount an incredible amount, 6.4% of GDP becomes unobserved. So in order to keep up with the competition, you need to hide, in a way, from official markets, which is obviously very disturbing. But it's not unique. But first of all, how did it happen? Basically, exploiting immigrants whose number tripled in the period between 2000 and 2008, almost tripled. These two curves show entirely flexible wages, uh, contracts, labor contracts. And you see the upper curve is the one pertaining the immigrants. The other are uh, official Italian workers. So the entire flexibility needed to keep the economy uh, in sync with the competition in Europe, is unloaded onto immigrants. And who are immigrants? Unknown voters. They do not vote. So this is a politically very efficient way to unload the costs of adjusting to the global competition onto non voters. And this is exactly what happens in other countries as well, also in, in a different way. This is France, which grows faster than Germany, almost throughout the whole existence of the euro area. As we know, the difference is basically given by the con contribution to GDP growth given by export, net exports, is plus 0 0.6 in Germany throughout the, this period, minus 0 0.2 in France. So uh, the possibility to growth is granted by domestic demand 
supported by uh, states' transfers of income. And this is compatible with the fact that also the level of growth in France is persistently above the potential growth rate, the French potential growth rate, the deficit is never balanced. The, deficit in, the public deficit uh, in France is constantly too high relative to the uh, stability, impact, uh, stability pact rules. What does it mean? In the 10 years between uh, 2000 and 2010, Italy, uh, sorry, France piles uh, the equivalent of 20% of its GDP in public debt, which was not justified by the rhythm of growth of the economy. But again, what is public debt and due public debt? Is unloading the cost of adjusting the economy or making it grow onto future generations, non electors, again. This is the same pattern that happens throughout the euro area in different ways. In the south, costs are diverted to minorities of non-voters. In Spain, two-thirds of the labor force it has uh, full uh, coverage and safety in uh, labor contracts, and the flexibility is provided by a minority, again, a minority of voters. It's a politically efficient way. Similar things have happened not only in Italy, but even Schwarzarbeit in Germany has increased dramatically in the same period. So black market in Germany as well. So you find people who are normally a minority to unload the political costs. In France, we have seen a different pattern, future generation, and similarly it happened uh, with... Uh, outsized increase in the public budget in uh, several countries. Uh, we, uh, you probably are familiar with the criticism against Ireland, Luxembourg, Austria and the Netherlands about uh, strategy that other countries uh, dub as uh, Baghdad neighbor in uh, adopting regulatory regimes or fiscal regimes that draw away from uh, other countries' taxpayers' money. But what happens in Northern Europe and in Germany in particular. Well, th in this case, we do not have really a, str a stratagem, a gimmick, but it's a real strategy and it's an intelligent one. Uh, um, we know that between the 90s and uh, uh, the 2000s, after 2000s, uh, the, sum, the addition of uh, export imports uh, on GDP in Germany grows from 52% to more than 90%. It was lower than in France and Italy. It's now three times higher than in Japan and the US. This produced uh, through an enormous amount of domestic net savings, which was reinvested in uh, uh, high yielding government bonds in other countries and uh, produced uh, uh, the equi in a, a cautionary estimate would be roughly 1% of GDP uh, adding 1% of GDP to Germany through uh, foreign taxpayers money uh, paid on the yield, through the yields of government bonds uh, in, that was the object of investment by the uh, German banking system. As you may know, uh, according to the Bundesbank, 87% of the German banking system has some uh, relation with the state. It's not private, in a way. And most of it has statutory limit to the, the profitability. What happens? They collect the savings domestically. They reinvest the money one trillion euro invested in the periphery of the euro area. This brings back, let's say, 100 billion each year. But this cannot remain in uh, uh, banking profits, must be distributed to firms through long-term uh, low interest rates or through investment in local infrastructure in the lender through the Landesbanken, which obviously increased political consensus 
And again, it's a way to preserve political consensus through foreign voters, foreign taxpayers. This system uh, has uh, characterized not only uh, Germany. Uh, these two graphs show uh, the, uh, that most of the EU fastest growing countries apply the same strategy, have uh, uh, high national net savings, so they live, as we say, below their own means. They save more than we would expect from a standard macroeconomic model, and they invest even uh, less at home. And you, you find exactly all the, all the usual countries that you mention as faster growing countries uh, among the others uh, so Finland, Netherlands, Austria Denmark, Belgium uh, I, can't, I can't read because I can't see and Germany and you find again the same countries on the other graph as countries that do not invest at all they invest abroad and bring back the yields from outside so, this is my interpretation of the crisis. We were not prepared domestically to understand how interdependent we were, how many effects our political decisions at home had on neighboring countries. And what we have done was trying to substitute monetary policy, which was an extremely powerful instrument to keep consensus Think of how you readjust tradable and non-tradable sectors through inflation or devaluation or recovering competitiveness without uh, uh, making people notice it too much, simply devaluing. Well, this was a very powerful political instrument. We substituted with less visible um, political tools, as we have seen. But when the crisis broke... The system was so fragile because we abused of those tricks and the system was trained exactly in those points. So German banks intermediating so much were almost uh, bust in 2008. French fiscal policy had no margin anymore. Italy's growth collapsed because the economy was fragilized by this bad adaptation to the new <coughs> com production composition required by global competition, Spanish unemployment went through the sky. Uh, what does it mean in political terms? If I have five minutes. Uh, oh, okay. please. Uh, what is the lesson of this incapacity to adjust to the new environment? Well, basically, we have not been able... In a way, democracy has reacted, but democracy has national borders. And uh, we were not prepared to consider that the effects of our policy choices would reverberate in neighboring countries and eventually come back in the shape of a, such a dramatic crisis. Why? Uh, well, my understanding, as uh, you were so kind as to mention the the book uh, published in 2012 and now it's a, an, I open an adver advertising space <laughs> saying in the next month a new edition uh, a larger edition of the book you mentioned is coming out for Brookings Institution and uh, I elaborated the book is a narrative so these analyses and these graphs are not contained in in the book is simply a narrative of the crisis. Uh, but it, I felt the urge to go further and understand what had happened in a, a more analytical way. And what this book will present to the public as a possibility is that we are actually victim of the past much more than we understand. Basically, what we have pretended to do was to consider our countries as self-sufficient, as n not so interdependent in political and economic terms as they really are. And why that? Because self-sufficiency is a s mindset of people 
who have legitimated the nation states as the actor of a conflict, of war. In a way, the past, the European past is still with us. If we have a source of legitimation of the nation states, is still the defense of the people in conflict that have forged European history. But when you are in a war, you don't want to depend on the other countries. We're still in this mindset. We don't want to open our mind to interdependency, and interdependence has crushed the gate and entered into our homes with this major crisis. And my understanding that we are still far from understanding how interdependent we are and that the solution of the crisis is still hanging on this uh, cultural gap. Uh, I guess I'll... Oh, sorry. Chacun sa merde is a reaction that uh, the first episode uh, I, I tell in the, in the book... Uh, was meeting at uh, the beginning of October 2008 between Chancellor Merkel and uh, President Sarkozy um, on the stairway of the Elysee. And Sarkozy tried to convince Merkel to put together money and a fiscal backstop for facing the banking crisis, as you, more than anybody else in this world, know what Merkel answered and said, and said no. Uh, everybody has to to take care of uh, their national problems. And so Sarkozy turned to an aide and said, uh, she doesn't want, she said, chacun sa merde, each his own merde. <laughs> <laughs> well, this is in a way has continued to be the rule during all the crises until intergovernmental uh, uh, practices have taken over, think of how the fiscal compact has exited the EU legislative framework. And, uh, well, the very first episode of intergovernmentalism was May, 9, uh, May the 9th in 2010, when the EFSF was established outside the EU legislative framework as an intergovernmental uh, treaty. And uh, I'm, I'm not going into the details, but it's... Uh, it's a long story of breaking the idea that we can all decide on the majoritarian principle, uh, voting a majority, and uh, uh, what has taken over is a uh, hierarchy between creditors and debtors uh, that Mario Monti uh, dubbed as creditocracy. Uh, unfortunately, this fits with the intergovernmental structure of decisions uh, and this, again, is often a way to deny the interdependence of consequence. I'm not going further. I had a few things uh, to say, but this is basically what I wanted to discuss with you.